to what extent do people are uh, people aware of the of the human rights and uh, do they report and what actions get taken by the authorities when these cases reach their attention. The importance of reflecting on human rights obviously um, cannot be understated. Uh, any country is founded on certain set of values, but those values do not necessarily uh, permeate into public consciousness. Uh, to ensure that human rights become part of our second nature, become part of our public consciousness, we constantly have as a society to reflect on these uh, and also reflect through the lives of uh, iconic figures who embody not only the history that we seek to run away from or to leave behind, but also embodies the values that we seek to mold this republic along. So reflecting on representative figures such as Nelson Mandela is an important reminder of what we seek to become. So this lecture really reflects on all those matters, the importance of human rights, the meaning of Mandela. Have we gotten, how far are we in our march to becoming a different society that we envisaged back in 1994? Um, with those opening words, few words, I would like to hand over to the acting CEO Ms. Louise Mabe to officially open our conversation. Ms. Mabe, you, the floor is yours, and I'm told you have 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you, a program director, and greetings to everybody all our important guests and the guest speaker you are all welcome i would want to raise a serious issue that we are very proud during this year of may charlotte Manya Matweke, that this year is dedicated to her and for the fact that for quite some time we have not been giving sufficient attention to the contribution of women in the liberation struggle. We have a lot of women who've been engaged in the liberation struggle and we did not give sufficient attention to their contribution so that the public as well as the world at large could reflect on that contribution. And Mayor Charlotte Matweke is one of those stalwarts that we need to learn from in terms of her vigilant, vigilance and as well as what she made during her lifetime. There are great milestones where he challenged, she challenged the status quo and became one of the first women who could make a difference in the lives of South Africans at large. And we are very excited that today we have this engagement, which is going to highlight some of her achievements, but also being a sounding board towards the contribution of women in the liberation struggle. And we are also excited that as we go forward in the future, we will also, as leaders in the society, ensure that our children, our descendants become part of the knowledge, this rich knowledge that we are responsible for, that can make our country, as well as all of us as participants in the liberation struggle. And we must also remember that at this time, the battle is not yet won, it's not yet won in terms of where do we place our heritage? Where do we place our culture? And we have even seen recently the outburst that was there in relation to respect of African heritage, African uh, culture. So I am looking forward, we are looking forward as an institution in assisting, uh, in ensuring that 
culture and heritage are being given the necessary priority in our country, but also in the continent. And as an implementing agency of the department, we are also prepared and looking forward to working with the department and ensuring that with Vision 2030, we will make the necessary contribution. I would not like to be too long, but to say all of you, you are welcome. And even those who are viewing this, these proceedings at home, at their different places, you are all welcome. This is the, the, the NHC. This is the year of May Charlotte Manyama Kweke. And we need, as we go forward for the whole year, there will be different activities. And we are looking forward to inviting more people to become part of this wealth that we have and acknowledge, like I had indic indicated, the wealth of contribution that was made by women in the liberation struggle. And this should not be undermined. So all of you, you are welcome. And thank you very much, uh, 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 Program Director. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mabe. Um, our next speaker, main speaker, uh, needs very little introduction. She's one of the bravest women I know, has served her country splendidly, not only after the democratic break breakthrough, but also during apartheid. Um, I remember her as when she was in parliament as chairperson of one of the committees, I think it was defense, where she opposed the executive uh, taking on issues of principle against the sale of arms to certain countries and her objection based on principle did not go well with the executive, but she took that stand nonetheless. And she has gone on uh, within her own party and generally in society speaking up against issues that uh, uh, a violation of uh, basic decency, standing up for principle even at the expense of her own comfort. Um, Madam Speaker Tandi Mudise has, is an example, I think, for most of us to follow, that when the crowd, if you hear a howling, if there is a crowd, the fact that there is a crowd, it doesn't mean that that crowd is correct. You still have to follow principles. We need not be guided by noise, even if that happens at your own expense. But ultimately, because your standpoint is correct, is guided by justice and decency, ultimately you prevail because the truth does prevail at the end of the day. Uh, with those few words, Madam Speaker, I would like to hand over to you to take us through your lecture. Uh, and I have to remind you, uh, Sister Andy, you have 30 minutes. <laughs> over to you. Thank you very much. Um, your ladies and gentlemen, Mayor Louisa Mabe, um, it's not going to be a lecture. I didn't even know I have 30 minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I must say that I feel very, very honored to be invited to participate in this meeting. It's more of an honor because any opportunity to reflect on uh, human rights, on the liberation struggle and reconciliation as the Nelson Mandela generational legacy in the year of Charlotte McQuackie cannot be missed. Would be wrong to miss being present, throwing in a few words, precisely because we are at a point in South Africa where we need to really seriously sit down and look back. Look back at our culture of human rights as a country look back at what we have done, look back at the incompleteness of our stops and starts, look back and not despair, but look forward also 
looking back at whatever it is that we might have overdone or not really followed through because it has an impact on how we are behaving today. It's a look back that must enable us to refocus, to accept and hopefully to develop some muscles and some fortitude to follow through, to correct, and to call ourselves to order, following in the footsteps of one Charlotte McGregor, who was honest and a confronter, a rattler of cages, and into the stubborn man I am very honored to have served under, the conciliator and the confronter, Nelson Mandela. So I believe that we do need to reflect on these two remarkable people, to take inspirations from the values that they inspired, to emulate their unwavering commitment to freedom, equality, justice, and dignity for all, and to support the younger generations of South Africa who must still find their own missions and their little hills and mountains to climb, who must still be given the space to make their mistakes, but not be given the latitude to destroy, because it is important that we always, always remember that freedom means nothing if we cannot re respect the rights of the other person next to us. We may think that we know better. We may think that the road we have traveled has been so rough that we will want to build a smoother one from these ones. But sometimes you must allow them to trample on your smooth path and to find the rough edges on this one that you think is perfect and smooth. For me, that is what the simplest definition of basic human rights is all about. It is not just about the right to stand anywhere and to smoke or drink. Because remember, at a particular time in the history of this country, it was a right denied to others. It is not just about going to a church um, in town or in the location, or it is about the right whether I want to become a Christian or not. It is about the ability to stand up. Father Lepsley, I tell a story about how I came to be called Ruth. It's baptismal. Uh, my parents, thinking they are really Pan African, have given me two names. And then Father says, no, but um, we need a name, a Christian name. And a few weeks earlier, I have had a little rough and tumble in the park in Freiburg and have beat a white kid because I'm not supposed to be in the park in town. And my mother says, you are just like Ruth, referring to Memon Party. And so when they got into this thing of getting a baptismal Christian name, I became Ruth. Proud to have been named after a woman strong enough in her convictions, feisty, but also forthright in following through in what she wants to do. But today, it is a right of any child, not only to have a Christian name or not to have it, but also to have the right to exist. It is also the right of this child to declare that they are and they have a right to a citizenship following through. It is the right of this child to go to school. It is the right of this child to be protected against hunger at school and at home, against abuse in the street and at home. It is the right of this child later on to have access to quality higher education. It is right for the grandmother and the mother of this child who is indigent to have assurance of portable water, of shelter, of free medication for chronic diseases. So when you look at that basket of rights, South Africa has done very well. 
when you look at how they are exercised, you then must point a finger at the institution I lead, Parliament, because it is in our niceties, it is in how we guard those whose rights we must really guard and promote that we sometimes lack. That is why sometimes you have sewage running in the streets, now beginning to tamper with the basic rights to good health, now beginning to tamper with the right to clean and potable water. Sometimes there isn't even potable water. So you have a South Africa which has done very well at the beginning and has done very well in writing down what is basic. It has allowed us to marry who we want to marry, a right we didn't have. It has allowed women to choose the number of children they wish to have. But it has also introduced, perhaps too quickly, a change into the African cultures and customs. Too much emphasis where parents have now stepped back and the behavior of children has become the business of government. So I always argue, Comrade Wiesa, that you cannot have a parent who says the government says I cannot discipline and therefore leaves the discipline and the character formation of their child mortgage to a state who is seated in Pretoria and in Cape Town. So we, we, we need to go back to looking at our understanding as Africans, what these rights are. But when we do so, we need to begin to go back to how we got here. And that is why it is important for us to look at the laws which under the guidance of Tambo and Mandela and the parliaments of the first 10 years that we crafted in. It is important for us to know that in Mandela, you have a man who understood rights or deprivation. When he had to find a name, like my mother had to find a name, he lost something. When he had to abandon the family home and go into the mines in a land far away, Johannesburg, he lost something. When he was needed at home, he couldn't go back home because he had to make a living in Johannesburg, and it wasn't because of choice. Remember the whole issues of taking away people's land, of taking away people's uh, uh, freedom of movement, of taking away um, an imposing politics which enabled or disenabled men to play their rightful role in society. Now, if you want to go back there, you can argue that for the African woman, that was the beginning of hell. Overnight in the rural areas, we had to be heads of families, but not have a say culturally. Overnight, we had to be deprived of what some in some communities defined a wife, the ability to bear children because the man is sitting in the mine or in the kitchens in Khalkin. Overnight, you had to, when this man comes home for Easter or for Christmas, make sure you fall pregnant or, or carry the burden of being a bad magoti. All that name calling brought down the status of women lower than we wanted them to be brought. And that is why it became easier for black women, African women, to be really third class citizens because they were lower than their other sisters in the other different um, twin. So it is important that um, we refocus on to what Nelson Mandela stood for, whether what is being initiative I personally think I will benefit from or not, whether I have feelings about people who are otherwise sexually orientated, whether I believe that certain churches or religions must exist or not, whether the jobs are opening up fast enough and wide enough for all the genders of South Africa to occupy, whether the South African women have grown teeth enough 
to ensure that there is equal pay for equal work, whether the nights are safe for us both in the streets and in the bedrooms. Because you talk about human rights, you have to start at the basics. It is not about the ability to take our children to any school. It is the ability for our children to define themselves as full citizens who can do anything, express themselves in any language they choose because they are free to do so. So we look at Mandela, the reconciler, the man who deprived of freedom, starts the ball rolling for reconciliation and talks. The man who says it was important to leave the prison cell behind because if I did not forgive, I would stay in prison forever. It is important for us to look at what it means to forgive. Does it mean that we accept that people in the rural areas are not as important as the people in the urban areas? Does it mean that the structure of the schools in the rural areas must be substandard. Uh, when Louisa was the MEC for, for education in the, in the Northwest, we would spend weekends together going to primary schools in different parts of the Northwest, cleaning up toilets with our hands, with our own money, busy cleaning up gardens in schools because we thought your environment also tells you who you are and what you can dream about. And so we would do that without thinking that the state needed to do something. We would encourage parents and the neighborhood people to come in and entrench the rights of children to live and to play in clean and safe spaces. We celebrate Matwake. Because we believe as South African women, how born 150 years ago, she was not only a challenger, but also an initiator. And it is right that we really celebrate this woman. We celebrate her because she was also a gender activist and a human rights campaigner a leader of communities, both men and women. It is an open secret in the ANC that um, she was the only woman in the room when the ANC was formed in, in, in Mangau. That she went on not only to recruit two men, but to also encourage them to stand and two of these men later on became presidents of the ANC. And this was because Obviously, Charlotte could not even take a chance and stand and challenge those men because women were not full members of the ANC. They were associates. So it is important for us to look at her, her courage. We are told that she tackled issues. She confronted issues. She angered her male compatriots because we are told that sometimes as they are still thinking, she would be busy confronting the government of the day on issues which were important to children, important to education, important to women. We today celebrate this South Africa and proudly say we are gender activists because she set us up. She was a community developer. She pushed for women and family empowerment. She volunteered to get into areas where others were not getting into. We are told that um, she was very clear that women must be made conscious of their political connection and that our political connection was nothing without the seriousness of our demands and our rights. So when government then said 
she was very clear that unless we understood our demands, we understood our sufferings, we understood our aspirations, we would not be able to come to where we can work together as the oppressed and focus on getting that which would enable us to one day say we are a free and an equal society. Unfortunately, we celebrate uh, Meshadot Makweke in a year that uh, has a pandemic that is swallowing people and swallowing careers. We have not moved enough when we look at what this pandemic is uh, showing us up because we still see the disparities between the urban and the rural. We still see the disparities between the white and the black. We still see the disparities between the men and the females. So 150 years on, the conditions that Charlotte Makweke fought for, mobilized for, encouraged women to encourage men to stand up on, still persist. We are cognizant of the fact that from 1994, under the guidance of Mandela, differences were made, clinics were built, roads were built, more opportunities were done, the um, economic field policies were put in to try and push us in. But we also know that we are back on the back foot because in the relaxation that now things are put there so that the equality projects, the respect for human rights is in place, corruption crept in. It ate away from what we had actually started feeling good about building. So corruption does hinder us because it takes away the resources to continue us as a people towards ensuring that we really can say we are a country that has entrenched our rights in the laws and in the constitution. We are policing them as members of parliaments and public representatives to make sure that every cent that the state spends goes to where it should go. Corruption then makes the disparities even worse. It hurts even more when you connect the black faces who are supposed to be the wrecking balls destroying the disparities to ensure that equality really happens, happen. It pains us when in the midst of these disparities, in the midst of losing work, women's rights, which we had taken so much time to build, gets reversed because men's anger again is directed at the weaker of the sexes, the women. That is if you accept that you are the weaker of the sexes. I've never accepted that. And I've always thought that you do not need a crowd to fight for what you think is right. Mandela taught us to be honest. He taught us the basics. Be punctual, be honest, be tidy. Stand for what you believe in, even if you are the only person there. If you are sure you are right, and if you get corrected, and you are not sure, take your time to go back to all the advice and the chastising that you get and see if you can redeem or change your focus. But never become an anarchist because some people are opposing your view. Now, if we be believe that because I have the right to speak and to associate, I therefore have the right to disrupt the others, then I begin to misunderstand what we fought for because we fought for rights to be enjoyed by all not for my right to infringe on the right of memory, not for my right to feel comfortable with my family, to take away from the poor children, to take away from the sick, to let hospitals collapse because I and my family come first. And besides, we are a mixed economy, I can be rich. 
we in our language say which means you work for what you need and that is the right thing to do we we want to say that um, for south africa to get anywhere for South Africa to do what Mema Tlaike stood for, for South Africa to do what Madiba begged us to do. And I remember when the truth and, uh, and the TRC was set up and the women from MK refused to go. He called us and said, you must go. And we said, no, we're not going. We, we, we got so humiliated that we don't think we want to open up our old wounds. And he said, reconciliation is not about your personal pain. It is that you contribute to the healing of the majority. That all of us can understand that we have all gone through pain, but we have come out and we need to hold hands and to build. So we need to do that when we buttress our culture of human rights as South Africa. We need to really say that we were led by women of stature. You will remember that it is South African women, Memabe, who were at the front um, uh, line of forming what was later known as the Pan-African Women's Organization, which was the forerunner of the organization of the African Union. So women in South Africa have always been conscious of rights, have always gone in. Indeed, when we read more about Matlake, we hear that she actually invited herself and became a regular at a European and Bantu club somewhere in Pretoria. Because perhaps in those years, it was important for her to get closer, to bring the pain closer, but also to appreciate what the other half was living through. Because as we later on went to we became aware that we may have been judging white women in South Africa too, actually. We looked at the construction of the family structures, both in the Africans and in the, in the white communities. And that is why Masisulu went out of her way to say, initiate a relationship which is not based on I work, you pay me, madam. Initiate a relationship between the mates and the madams, which said we are both mothers. Initiate that exchange over the weekends. During the week I'm in your house, madam, I'm looking after you and your children. Weekends, please come to Sowe to come see how I am living. That enabled us later on, as South African women, to go to that conference in um, Amsterdam and to come out with what then laid the cornerstone of not only the Women's Charter, but the constitution, the rights that are entrenched in chapter two. Because for us as women, everything was possible. But if we were not recognized as equal human beings, if we were not given our right as citizens, nothing else mattered. So I would say that the multiple roles that we take on as women, as leaders, must always be respected. But what good is a country that has good laws, good treaties, it signs every time it meets somewhere, but fails to do the basics, to protect our children, to make sure that there is enough resources to enable those who are poor to get quality higher education, to entrench a culture of responsibility amongst our young people, to push them to run their race without interference from us, to focus on a future of South Africa that respects all our rights without looking at our religion or our color, to push for a South Africa that is fearless in holding the executive to account, to insist that when we put people 
in the institutions like human rights, like the public protector, like the auditor general, that we are sure that as parliament, we have done our work. Because I think that we fail our nation when we fail to do our work as public representatives, right there in parliament, holding the executive to account, right there in the streets, teaching and being taught by the people in bringing up the issues that are important to them. I think that 50 years from now, basically what we think are the most fundamental human rights that we must fight for will have changed. And so you can't have a basket of rights that you think you cannot change, you cannot expand simply because you are living now. You've got to have a system of government that from now and then looks at itself and examines whether what is in front of it is still relevant, needs to be knocked around, needs to be deleted from the books. In our times or our great grandmother's times, land was a main thing except when the railways were, 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 were now being built and land became uh, something that was left in the custody in the rural areas of the women. But of course, if the sun was there, the sun had better say over this land, which is being cultivated. And so 50 years from now, you might find a different type of family, a different type of needs. But we need to make sure that what we have now, the representation of women, that 50-50 that we are fighting about, is not just to get us there. It is to ensure that we are flexible enough to live through the needs of our families, of our communities, and to ensure that um, we become our sisters' keepers, our brothers' keepers. So, as I said, for me, reconciliation is a two-way street. There must be an acceptance that dialogue is necessary. There must be openness. There must be a willingness to apologize and a willingness to accept the apology. There must be a preparedness of both sides to hold hands and to build together. There must be an acceptance of sometimes the historic heads coming back to bite us in the butt. And we must then, when that happens, find a joint solution to deal with the bite. Not allow ourselves to be in disarray and to go back to racial or to sexism but to always as adults, as leaders, to forge ahead and say, we will reconcile, we will build together. So I hear youngsters saying the Rainbow Nation was a fluke. It's something that we cannot aspire for. Yes, it is wrong only if some of us take it for granted. It is wrong if I think that because historically I was disadvantaged, I've got the right to demand and get. It is wrong if my white sister thinks now it is nice and we can just forget the head of the past. It is right when we all teach our children to know that whether they are black or white, if they don't look out, they will lose a country. They will be ruled by people they don't know. They will lose the continent again because we lost it once. It is good for us to go back and say, how do we become part of the African family? This thing of South Africans thinking we are the only people who are clever because we are streetwise does not help. This thing that says we demand because apartheid was on our necks, it doesn't help us. So we need to say to my generation, just how well do we want to be remembered? And I think 
for some of us who want to be remembered for speaking out, not just to waste oxygen, but to speak to the issues which are really bothersome. It would be important for us if sometimes we can throw in solutions to the challenges that we find. It would be good to challenge in defense of the people, not just about our own emotions and feelings. It would be good for us to stop being on lookers on because we've got little patches that we want to protect. Uh, my family, my extended family, my business, my job. Ultimately, we want to be remembered like Charlotte McCracken, like Lillian Ngoy. Because if you think, uh, uh, Comrade Louisa, and you hear us praising, I had a woman who lived and worked closely to her, Dorothy Nyembe. And when we went to jail, she said to me, don't worry, Dana. You must speak your mind because now that Lillian is late, we all love her. When she spoke out, she made people uncomfortable. So make people uncomfortable, but leave something that says she lived, she led. She did not, or he did not, choose the comfortable corners. She spoke out when people other than herself or her group, his group, were in trouble. So we need to be talking more about racial reconciliation, finding each other, rather than widening the gaps between black and white, rather than widening the sexism between all of us, male and female, Accept that we now have many genders in between the two. Accept that all of us have the right to exist. Accept that the church never pronounced itself on issues of sexism. In fact, I would argue, Father Lepsky, that Jesus Christ was the first one to recruit women into serious positions in church. And therefore, let us, in the footsteps of those that we walk behind, remember, South Africa will disintegrate into chaos. We are already beginning to go there because we are failing to safeguard our rights. And we can only safeguard our rights if we stand up against corruption, against lies, against misconduct, against disunity, and try and sometimes even when the pain is deep, to reconcile with those that we generally would not want to associate with because it's not about us. It is about the future. It is about this country which has been led by great women and men, Bushanot Makweke and Nelson Mandela. I want to stop there because as I said, I did not know I have 30 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much for your very thoughtful remarks and um, questions, raising lingering questions that still requires answers. Um, you have just reminded us that uh, our commitment to creating a human rights-based society is not only a responsibility of the state, but also the citizenry must participate. Uh, there are a lot of questions that you have raised. The fact that in accessing our rights, we need to be careful about how we express our demands for those rights. And at times that expression seems to uh, happen in an uncivil manner that raise questions about how we bring up our own children and that perhaps parents have neglected their responsibility to parent, fearing maybe that if they were to parent as their parents used to do, they might be trampling on the human rights of their children. The question is, how then do you parent in an age that emphasizes human rights? Does the emphasis on human rights necessarily mean that parents have to neglect their responsibility to parent? How do you balance the two if at all there is any tension? 
And secondly, how do we disabuse men, some men of this idea that they own women, that they can do with their bodies as they please? There's a, there continues to be an outcry in our society of the scourge of violence and murder. It doesn't seem to be dissipating. Instead, we hear more and more cries. How do we get to silence the cries? How do we get some men to behave humanly? And of course, Parliament has its own responsibility. Parliament is entrusted uh, with ensuring that appropriate laws are passed to monitor expenditure of public finances, that finances reach people who are most needy. And in doing so, Parliament has to function optimally. And the question I think that you've also raised is whether or not Parliament does function optimally. Uh, does Parliament speak the truth or does Parliament uh, hide behind the majority, the idea of majoritarianism, behaving tribally, protecting people of your own party, regardless of what might be on the table because your party has to prevail. What political science scientists call tribal behavior in politics. Are we as parliament living to that responsibility? We have been indicted, parliament has been indicted on this a couple of times. How far are we uh, in ensuring that we do what we ought to do? It would be interesting to get your answers to that. And lastly, for me on this, is in as much as we decry wastage of money and corruption, to what extent has Parliament enabled public institutions to investigate and prosecute the NPA, the Hawks? We've been hearing cases just recently, one or two cases of witnesses who escaped uh, an assassination. What happens to whistleblowers? We talk about whistleblowers. We invite people to uh, report wrongdoing, and yet we leave them out in the lurch. What is the responsibility, responsibility of parliament? Is parliament living up to that? Those, for me, I think, would be the key things. And, uh, and, and the very last point is that it's not enough that we speak about human rights. We have to live out this principle in our own conduct. Exemplary leadership, as you pointed out, with respect to MK women told by Mandela, not only to please, to act in a way that seeks to please themselves, but to act in an exemplary manner to communicate a particular message. Is parliament communicating that particular message? So those are the things that I'm sure uh, uh, our panelists and everyone else who's logged in has picked up quite a number of things. And uh, perhaps during Q&A, uh, Madam Speaker, you might reflect on those and other things that will come up. And I'm quite certain that Ms. Colette Letrojane has her own uh, strong views uh, as well on the subject. Uh, Ms. Litrojane is the Executive Director of the Human Rights Institute of South Africa and a law, a, an activist of long standing on human rights issues. Uh, I remember her a couple of years ago uh, organizing submissions to the committee that had been set up by Kara Asma to evaluate the efficiency of the Public Protector Human Rights Commission. Um, she did a stunning job uh, with those submissions and a number of issues were raised to improve the efficiency of these chapter nine institutions. Uh, Colette, with those words, I hand over to you to share your thoughts with us. Thank you, uh, Programs Director, uh, Professor Sirisi Mkechana. You, Let might me... want to, you might want to tilt your screen a little bit because we are only seeing nose upwards. We're not seeing 
the rest of your face. There you go. Perfectly. <laughs> Is it fine? That's perfect. Yeah. OK. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh, let me begin by observing protocol, by acknowledging the presence of our honorable speaker of parliament, Ms. Tandi Murise, distinguished professors, doctors, eminent persons, dignitaries, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. I also wish to express my thanks and appreciation to the human, uh, what is it, National Heritage Council uh, for providing Jurisa this opportunity to be part of this historic milestone to reflect on our Human Rights Month, uh, which is achieved out of uh, very traumatic events of the apartheid regime and the sacrifices of our heroes and heroes who demonstrated their bravery to fight the injustice, um, the separate development agenda, uh, which was inhuman and degrading, and um, of the majority of the people that were subjected um, uh, to this treatment with by the minority with impunity. We are humbled by this gesture of uh, being uh, added on this important program. Our heritage and legacy of our father of human rights and democracy, Dr. Nelson Mandela, inspired not only South Africans, but the global community and his contributions to the international and regional human rights trajectory has been pursued um, with pride in uh, addressing non-discrimination, equality, human dignity. His contributions are inedible and we are seeing them as cemented and are truly long lived for generations to generations. For us at the Human Rights Institution, the legacy of Mandela is important for us. Uh, we have seen ourselves advancing our passion to promote human rights and protect them, to advocate for their protection in our country, in our constitution, by our um, uh, oversight mechanisms such as your chapter nine institutions, the judiciary and all state institutions responsible for promotion and protection of human rights. When Austin Mandela visited Norway, he mobilized funding for the Goldstone Commission of Inquiry into Public Violence in 1993 to execute its hard mandate. It was through the residue from this funding that led to the conception or establishment of the Human Rights Institute of South Africa, which we pride ourselves today that the organization is still in existence, enjoying the benefits of the hard work of Nelson Mandela. We, as we remain proud about his legacy, the records collected from the Goldstone Commission of Inquiry were donated to the Nelson Mandela Foundation. This was with a view of increasing information, knowledge, and drawing lessons from his history, from this history and the bravery of Tata Mandela in supporting establishment of the first commission of inquiry into public violence in South Africa under a very volatile environment of apartheid characterized by disenfranchisement of the majority of people, um, torture, uh, enforcing torture, uh, economic disparities, understand models reserved for the majority as a place of living with no infrastructure developed for water, sanitation, electricity, inferior education designed 
as a ban to education and landlessness of people, freedom of association, assembly, expression regarded as uh, uh, prohibited in the country. The dedication of the 2021 to Sherlock Makeke in South Africa further furthers commitments to address gender-based violence, the right to health, freedom of association and expression without fear uh, at the time when patriarchal norms uh, were more prevalent than now and were obstacles, were obstacles doubled by the policy of apartheid, which dehumanized and had no recognition of black persons. We are grateful that the country is using this process, the name of Charlotte Matreke, to elevate the rights of women in the country and to justify their right and to continue for their protection and to ensure that the laws that South Africa has adopted uh, for addressing gender-based violence are, are you know, implemented. And uh, we also acknowledge the fact that under that environment where reprisals was prevalent, she was able to express the views as a woman. She was a defender of women's rights without fear. And uh, uh, to policies that were described as crimes against humanity, how we need to uh, uh, examine how uh, the legacy of Charlotte Matreke impact on the current uh, situations of human rights in the country. How is this enormous contribution, you know, assisting the situation that women in South Africa are facing, uh, you know, to change uh, what we are currently going through, especially in terms of ensuring that the extrajudicial killings, uh, persecutions of human rights defenders, the civil society activists, and uh, the brutal murders that have been committed to whistleblowers, the abductions that are continuing under an environment which is um, supported by a progressive constitution. How come we are still stuck in our past in uh, suppressing truth and not you know, shining with the lights that we have in our constitution? The hosting of this event coincides with the AU 2021 theme dedicated to arts, culture, and heritage. This, the, the, the theme uh, seek to advance regional agenda 2063, which envisions an Africa with a strong cultural identity. This strong cultural identity that South Africa has, where we have learned from the council commitments to elevate South Africa's sacrifices, the life stories of South Africans that were suppressed, that went through insurgency in this country, are being incorporated and put in a dignified manner that will be seen as important at international community. We are grateful that, you know, African uh, a cultural renaissance, uh, which is preeminent and uh, that will inculcate the spirit of pan-Africanism and also tapping into Africa's reach, into, into our own uh, heritage and culture, linguistic, it will be elevated. This will contribute positively to transformation in the country, restoring and preserving our own cultural heritage, including that in Africa, the languages that are, are so important in our country. We've seen that our delaying in promoting them, in speaking them, and also in wearing our African African uh, attires uh, is still a long battle that we are still fighting for. It is important to ensure that even during a webinars like this, one, we have local um, uh, uh, languages uh, that uh, people are able to express and follow uh, the proceedings. I will I'll stop now because I think uh, the chairperson is warning me that I'm taking too much time. Uh, <laughs> yeah, because I think that uh, 
uh, our traditions, our cultural beliefs. Now that we are under COVID-19, uh, we have seen how um, the role of traditional uh, practitioners in healing uh, our societies. Many people have claimed that the healings that have been recorded in the country is due to the role of traditional practitioners. How do we play, ensure that they play a role in a comprehensive manner? They are aired, they are recognized in contributing uh, to, to the fight or the prevention of COVID-19. I would like to end here and thank you um, for, for giving us this opportunity and also just to mention the words of uh, uh, Tabo, uh, uh, former President Tabon Beki when he said as in, he was inspired by the Ubuntu philosophy, I am because you are and you are because I am. Thank you very much for the question. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Drojan, especially for sticking to the 10 minutes allocated. Um, you have raised very important things and reminding us that uh, human rights is a multifaceted um, uh, aspect uh, with a number of things, not just livelihoods, um, but also culture and language. Um, that human beings uh, are made up of multiple, they're an embodiment of multiple constituents. They have the need for food, for shelter, but they also have identity. And identity at times is important in how people act and how people perceive themselves. You are what you know about yourself. So language is important in building a sense of identity and identity that affirms that you are because you live, that learner um, umoto. So issues of language and culture are critical in the promotion of human rights. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Marjorie Jobson, who is the National Director of Kulumani Support Group. This group has undertaken a, a very important, if not difficult mission to make sure that the recommendations of the TRC as they were made way back in 98, that they come to light. Um, I was just reminded just recently, a couple of days ago, in my home city, Port Elizabeth City, uh, or rather Nelson Mandela City, you now can tell where I stand. I'm not really a, a fan of Kabeha. So in my Port Elizabeth city, my hometown, a, an old activist, Ronnie Prince, has passed away, died a pauper, really. Uh, and because of that, his funeral has had to be postponed. And a call had to go out to comrades to donate towards his funeral. And this is a comrade who has dedicated his life to the civic movement, especially in the northern areas of Port Elizabeth, or rather Nelson Mandela City. And so that really calls into question as to whether or not the new republic has honored its promise towards its activists. Have there, has there been any compensation? Has there been any reparations? What do we mean by transformative justice? Marjorie. Is this a pipe dream? Is this something that we talk about? Or is it something that we're pursuing on a day-to-day basis? Over to you, uh, Dr. Jobson. Please tell us. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Professor Nuledyana. And thank you for this opportunity created by the National Heritage Council. I'm very honored to be participating in this event. Um, in this final day of Human Rights Month in South Africa. So I wanted to start with the theme of this meeting, the generational legacies of human rights in South Africa, and um, trace it back from 1994 with the inauguration of Nelson Mandela and his very famous statement made in his inaugural speech at the Union Buildings, that never again should this beautiful land experience oppression of one by another. 
um, and the promise that that unlocked for people, because I think we have people who live with enormous expectation and hope of actually achieving what we set out to do these many, many decades ago that characterize the resistance and liberation struggle. And I'm particularly grateful that um, this is going to become a, a theme of a specific museum going forward. And I think the National Heritage Council has a, a key role in doing that. And so if we move from, from that hope and promise that was unlocked by Mandela, um, Kulumani started the following year in 1995 when Parliament was debating the promotion of National Unity and Reconciliation Act. And what had already emerged at that time was that um, people with power and influence were debating, newly, uh, newly gained in, in influence, but they were debating legislation that was going to have to address legacies of gross human rights violations, but with very little participation by the people themselves. And so that became a key theme for Kolumani. Um, founded in 1905, when they had to debate, are we going to have anything to do with this institution that is being created when we haven't played a, an equal participatory role in it? Um, and so, I mean, the decision was made through all the Kuluma groups, which led to our name being Kulumani, the speaking art. Um, it led um, to the to the founding of the Truth Commission in 1995, and from that 1995 to the adoption of the Constitution in 96. And so what be, this is a very interesting time for the people who carried most of the sacrifices of the struggle, um, because the Constitution actually from the very beginning became an incredible tool for Kulumani members, and it wasn't actually that they consciously realized how powerful the Constitution could be, but when people came forward because the TRC had not been able to accept their submissions because it closed completely for victims on the 14th of December 1997, there was this huge groundswell of people saying, but we, we contributed to this freedom and uh, we, want to, we want to lodge statements. So they started lodging statements with Kulumani. And when we had to create a form for people to register what had happened to them, we decided to frame it in terms of the Bill of Rights, which was an actually completely, um, um, you know, we didn't realize how powerful that was because there had been no rights for people and suddenly they were asked to read the 29 rights in the Bill of Rights and decide which of those rights had been violated and how it had been violated and then to write their submission that now makes up Kulumani's database of 130,000 statements, actually claiming, claiming and writing those rights. And, and I think that was a, a very interesting development. Um, so I want to go back to like, so where, where are we now? Because have we overcome oppression? If, if the constitution spoke about its promise of freedom and justice, um, Mandela said there shall never again be oppression of one by another. Um, and so the question we've been asking is, so what is the substance of our freedom? And have we eradicated oppression? And have we arrived at justice? And that's really where, where we struggle a lot because um, we were at a picket outside the Minister of Justice's um, offices last Thursday with the survivors of the Swanee Bull massacre which was a massacre on a greater scale than the Boi Pitong massacre. It was a massacre in which that um, approach to like, terrorizing communities was developed that a year later was used at Boi Pitong. And basically um, there were like 690 homes destroyed in that massacre. Um, countless people massacred, only 38 deaths um, recorded because the hippos were there when they, when they did this attack in the early morning and picked up dead bodies and removed them and nobody knew yet today where those bodies are. So, um, and, and so, so, so what our theme of the picket at the minister's office was, was a statement that comes out of the judgment in the constitutional court. The past will not leave us alone until we answer its claims to justice. And the big problem is that people had hope of equal justice and 
because of the um, sort of administrative limitations of the Truth Commission, they have not been afforded that access to equal justice. And justice issues resonate at a very core level of human beings. They know when they are treated with fairness and they know when they have not been recognized and accorded what they believe they should get. And for, for most victims, it starts with actually recognizing what they suffered, what they paid for our freedom, you know, to remember, to remember everybody who, who carried those costs. And, and so, um, so I think what we've forgotten in this whole struggle is that um, South Africa hosted what has been um, identified as the largest grassroots eruption of diverse nonviolent struggles in a single struggle in human history. I mean, we, we had this thing called the, the purple shall govern, and we were proud. We, we, I think there's never been a greater practice of strategies. And now we see, um, unfortunately, most of the protests these days turning incredibly violent, often because of agents from pocketers and infiltrators who are deliberately actually paid to disrupt um, people's attempts to raise their voices. And, and I think what we what we have not gone back to, and I hope this Liberation Museum will go and recognize that um, the precarious people in this country were incredibly precarious. Nat Nakasa used to talk about the precarity of human beings, everyday precariousness. How did people cope? How did they survive? And, and how did they, in all of that, ma manage to maintain this largest nonviolent grassroots movement in the whole history of human beings? And um, and so for, for Kunamani, um, that has been a, a, a key feature. We rejected the the Truth Commission being, you know, offering these hearings for victims because we don't believe that people became victims because they were helpless, powerless people. They were actually people who were asserting incredible agency on a very principled basis. And I think we've forgotten that. You know, when when we one of the things we did when we started trying to build civic competence among our communities. Um, was we asked people to go back and identify advocacy actions in which they had participated. And we heard the most incredible stories of the very first rent boycott in the whole country. You know, the histories that I think should be known and publicized and so that the young people can actually understand how extraordinary those advocacy actions were, those nonviolent, peaceful protests, the, the decisions, um, um, not not to cooperate, the, the peaceful boycotts, um, the alternative institutions that were created. Um, and so I think we have a, the most extraordinary resource for populating a museum, which should honor all these people who have not yet even, whose names are not yet even recognized or known in the country, but um, they are from grassroots communities. And, and and the the capacity they have to make sure that we develop a much more empowered citizenship based on what they learned from their participation in the struggle and since the since the struggle um, and in in their support for this movement from impunity to accountability and I think I mean, we were very grateful to be invited to send a delegation to the Stalwarts and Veterans Conference about three years ago. And what was exceptional for us was that um, there was a recognition that a huge gulf had emerged between grassroots and people in power for for actually a long, long time. And, and I, I'm hoping that this meeting will actually begin to value the knowledge that exists in that grassroots, what they have learned from their histories and how they can use those histories to assert an empowered citizenship. Um, so I think that, that those are the main points that I wanted to make. Um, um, what, what, we've, what we had to work on in Kulumani is how do you create an empowered citizenship? And we found that there were basically three steps in doing it. And it starts with reclaiming your historical consciousness. In, and um, so that and then the, the second step is is um, it, it was for um, 
sorry, I, I, I've written my notes in over a few pages. The second step was how to generate and support people thinking beyond the assumptions they make of each other to, to learn to practice critical thinking, to understand what the structures are that they have to live very constrained lives within and what the possibilities are for changing them. And then what Nat Nakasa used to celebrate, demonstrating emancipatory behavior by asserting choices and practices despite how constrained people's lives are, despite these struggles for daily survival. So um, th those are the things that we continue to try and share and empower people with because we want this, this freedom that we fought for to, to really live into equal justice for all people, which we haven't yet achieved because we haven't recognized all of those very valuable lessons of of the liberation struggle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. Uh, for those instructive uh, words, uh, there's an echo. Uh, is that OK now? Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for those instructive words. I think you've raised uh, a very fundamental point about recording history and how you record history, that history is not just made by great men, but great men are supported by the masses. Instead of centering our narratives around big people, important as they are, but we need to recognize that uh, history was also made by small people who marched to sacrifice their own time, and some of them achieved uh, magnificent feasts, magnificent achievement without being recognized. Uh, and also for telling history. History is uh, made up of a number of events. History evolves over time. And so to focus on one episode, one lose the completeness of the story. And so in talking to ordinary people, you are able to connect the various stories, the little incidents that led to that epoch-making event. So for completion, it is important that you recognize the small narratives, the ordinary folks, upon whom the big people stood, who hoisted the big people, because without those masses, the heroes would not have been what they became. Uh, but equally important, I think, is, is the point about creating dialogue. Um, I wonder to what extent you've, 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 you've managed to do that, to reach out, to create dialogues, um, especially with families, uh, apartheid assassins especially, um, uh, the culprits. Uh, has these dialogues with the victims worked? Uh, families of survivors, how are they dealing? What's their reaction when they have to deal with these torturers? Uh, does it help? Uh, I'm keen to, I think most people might be keen to understand that. And, and, and the victims, the families of the victims, do they overcome? Do they, do they get back to normal life? Do they forget that trauma? Does trauma ever leave them? Uh, I think we'd be keen to hear your reflections on that. Um, the next speaker is Professor Lonias Ndrovu, Dean of Law at the University of Vanda. Uh, Professor Ndrovu is going to reflect along with us on what we can learn from indigenous knowledge system to deal with issues of reconciliation and promoting of human rights. Um, knowledge is disseminated and resides in a number of areas, not only in book, and knowledge precedes colonialism. Um, Professor Ndlubu will help us in retrieving that and reminding ourselves about the importance of that knowledge, which has been passed on from one generation to another, and some of which 
is not recorded, but has been extremely useful in helping black folks along. Professor Jovo, over to you, sir. Thank you, Professor Lechana, the chair. And uh, I would want to also thank the National Heritage Council for inviting the University of Venda to participate in this uh, very important deliberation. I am here representing our Chancellor uh, Advocate Gumbi, who could not attend. So what I'm not I'm going to speak about what I'm going to talk about really <clears throat> is not his speech right I'm not going to be reading a speech I've just I was just asked to come so I'll be expressing my views I would also want to extend an important thank you message to our speaker of parliament uh, memo DC here uh, for your speech there are a couple of uh, issues that we could extract from your your speech as well in the context of uh, talking about in the context of talking about uh, the theme the important theme of uh, liberation you know human rights and of course the the, the legacy of mandela but I, I would want to begin my 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 my, my speech by reflecting on some of the issues the keynote speaker raised, which uh, have a direct or indirect bearing on indigenous uh, knowledge. And I would recall one main issue that rang through her speech was the issue relating to women and, you know, women reproductive rights and women rights. And one would actually look at uh, in terms of our indigenous knowledge and obviously how we live in communities. How do we treat our women? Do we view them as mothers who contribute to the family equally like men, or we just view them as objects you know, of expanding the family? And then in, in, in that uh, particular instance, what role does our indigenous uh, knowledge play uh, closely related to our traditional uh, beliefs? I was also, you know, struck by the keynote speaker's uh, reference to rights and their limitations and how uh, children are raised. That, you know, rights that we currently have at the moment that we consider as, you know, those foundational rights that they are likely to change and if one were to talk indigenous knowledge now and you know how we look at our communal way of living and we are saying how that has been impacted by the rights that uh, lie in main in, in the mainstream human rights discourse one may then say maybe it looks like there is a conflict there if we are going to look at our indigenous knowledge systems versus what our rights are going to be as our life progresses. One may say there is likely to be a conflict. Are we saying we want to go back? Are we saying we are looking at the, the, our rights developing with the life modernizing? But one can again go back and actually say, maybe before one learns about what rights are likely to look like in future, and whether they are really going to change, you know, according to how society develops or economies develop. One may actually say, what can we learn then from our indigenous knowledge? I am looking at issues like conflict resolution. We are look, talking about Mandela as a, a reconciler in chief. And we know our indigenous conflict resolution mechanisms are largely premised on the concepts of actually getting the parties to reconcile. We are not really looking at uh, getting, you know, like in litigation where you would want to say, I won a case, this person is obviously down. In, 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 in our indigenous uh, conflict resolution systems, we are looking at actually conciliation, compromising, and getting a solution that's favorable 
to, to, to most members of the community as a, a leading issue in that uh, particular instance. So we could actually look at our, <coughs> at our rights as constitutional dictates and say, although the constitution to many people in our indigenous communities is a modern document, which uh, actually spells out rights, which uh, most of our people in communal areas would regard as rights that conflict with most of our traditional norms and views as we view, we look at them. They must be in the new South Africa, looking at uh, what our main speaker, one, one, one point that our, our, our keynote speaker actually raised about Sherlock Makweke as someone who would have um, inspire us to keep questioning things. So I would actually say to a very staunch believer in indigenous knowledge and you know traditional ways of resolving conflict, there is actually a need in how we teach people about constitutional values and our rights and say, how then do we look at uh, our constitutional rights and say and reconcile them with the traditional knowledge. So I'm looking at a situation where we are going to be saying when we talk rights we, uh, and obligations and sanctions attended to violating the rights of others, one must actually look for answers not in modern constitutional law and human rights law only. We should actually look at our indigenous knowledge systems and say, does our indigenous knowledge system actually recognize certain rights? There are issues at the moment, people talking about land reform and whether, you know, our indigenous knowledge uh, recognizes those rights. And there's obviously the, the controversial issue. Uh, if one looks at uh, the Ingonyama Trust and uh, you are looking at how that came about, you know, communal rights, where the traditional system want, wanted to preserve those rights in that particular context. And at the same time, we have constitutional imperatives. So I am saying, you know, land that's owned using our traditional system. I mean, our, our, our traditional ownership of land, actually, and uh, land tenure and, you know, security there, if one zeroes in on the Nguyenyama Trust, is not necessarily an unconstitutional, you know, structure. We actually need to look at that critically and say, what were the objectives behind the establishment of the Nguyenyama Trust? What sort of mischief, when one views this from a traditional uh, standpoint, what sort of mischief was anticipated which the this peculiar form of a, land ownership was actually established to deal with. I would also want to zero in, although I'm talking indigenous systems here uh, and, and indigenous knowledge, I would also want to zero in on the right to health, which uh, our keynote speaker actually raised. And I would want to say, when we look at how South Africa has, how far South Africa has gone since the advent of democracy in, in the context of health, uh, section 27, how it has been litigated in the context of access to health care by our own people. We have seen Mandela initially at the center, you know, when litigation starts with the Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association case in 97, 98. And as we go on now and talk about COVID-19, access to vaccines, we still see that the conciliatory approach to access to medicine which uh, Mandela adopted during that pharmaceutical, we will be aware that the Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association case actually was settled out of court when Mandela used his magnanimity and you know his uh, ability to negotiate to convince those pharmaceutical companies to abandon the litigation route. Now we are in COVID-19. And uh, we've seen our country procuring vaccines from AstraZeneca, which vaccines were found to be very close to expiry and were not used. 
and now we are talking about vaccine rollout, which most skeptics regard as uh, something that's not going to succeed as planned. But I'm actually looking at this and saying, when we're talking about vaccines and procuring them at very you know, high prices, what are we then saying about our indigenous knowledge and indigenous uh, medicines? It looks like a lot of attention has been focused on vaccines, you know, pharmaceutical companies' patents to the total, almost total exclusion of indigenous knowledge. Um, have our traditional healers been asked to actually look at uh, natural remedies that are likely to help us in this, uh, you know, wither the storm around this pandemic? And uh, what has been talked about in the indigenous con context really uh, with the, the, the vaccines, most of us will be aware, we've been talking umklonyane and other very basic things. No one has actually been worrying about the fact that solutions may actually come from... Am I still on? You are, you are still on. Yes, you've sir. Just exceeded, you've, you've just exceeded your 10 minutes allocation. It, it looks like there was a blackout. No, not, not from my side. I've been hearing you perfectly. Can you hear me? Professor Njovu, can you hear me? Can you still hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes, I can hear you, but it's just it's just a black out. I see a black screen here. Uh, can other people hear him, or am I the only one? Raise no, your hand, please. 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 We can hear him. We can hear him. We can hear him, and we can see him as well. Why? Okay. No. Thanks for that. I don't know what was happening on my screen, but I was just uh, concluding around indigenous uh, knowledge relating to traditional medicines, and I was actually saying, we, when we look at the right to health in terms of Section 27, and the fact that uh, you know these rights are actually the rights of South Africans, and South Africans include. Uh, both residents of uh, urban areas and the rural areas, uh, we should be looking at uh, the possibility, I'm, I'm, I'm saying, of uh, solutions, for, uh, you know, dealing, I mean, with this COVID-19 and other public health emergencies, whether our traditional healers can't assist in that particular regard. I'm looking, I'm, I'm looking at a formal program where we could actually have maybe our higher education institutions partnering with local communities in order to find, you know, remedies in the traditional system, which remedies can then be modernized and extracted pharmaceutically. Yes, there the, the, the are a lot of issues now. I mean, when we are looking at our the extent to which our human rights situation is gone, or gauging whether we have had achievements, there's quite a lot that still needs to be covered in the context of health, in the context of uh, conflict resolution. L let me just stop here, Chair, and not go on, because I didn't check my time. I suspect I'm almost out of time now. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Professor Ndobo. You've raised uh, intriguing, if not entirely contentious points, uh, providing food for thought. One of the things that uh, the Madam Speaker uh, implored us to do earlier was not simply to criticize and highlight problems, but also offer solutions. And you've just highlighted a problem, but I thought the solution lies with you, which is ha has to do with indigenous uh, medicine. Uh, you've spoken quite eloquently about it. Obviously, your institution does some work on it. What have you done to package it? Did you have to wait for COVID-19 to think about this? What has been happening at your institution uh, about these things? 
making sure that indigenous uh, medicine is available, it's, it's packaged properly, it's commercialized. It has been with us for a while and you are in a province where quite a number of people do make use of indigenous medicine. What has your institution done? That would be my point to you instead of pointing yes, yes, to, yes, to the state. But it's something to respond to later on. But two more points. Yeah, I, I will talk about that. Yes, yeah. it's something I overlooked. But yeah. uh, there is no, certainly no, no, something. Not now. Not now. Not now. Thank you. Be, <laughs> That's be, fine. There'll be Q&A later on. Um, and and uh, the, the question you posed, which seems to uh, kind of presents change and and tradition in a dichotomous manner as if an evolving society renders certain cultural principles redundant um, does it mean that if with change certain principles become futile or do you adapt those principles to the changing society and also if some indigenous knowledge or principles are useless, why not teach them in light of what we know about society now and other things that we, we have found out about society, knowledge, new knowledge that might challenge existing knowledge that we have. Is, does the fact that it is indigenous necessitate that we retain it by all means necessary? Is it not dynamic? Uh, those would be a few, a few, a few questions from my side, and I'm sure colleagues have other questions they want to pose. And of course, lastly, the Ingonyama Trust. I think a lot of people would disagree with you that uh, what it has done is to legalize some kind of despotic control over <laughs> access to land in the rural areas. Uh, and yet, maybe you can elaborate about the fanciness of it the good intentions around it because everything <clears throat> was done and a lot of things were found to be a little bit incorrect or wrong about how it practices, whether or not it does provide land to the intended subjects or it benefits a certain elite. So I'm curious to hear your wisdom on those things, given that you have cited them. Um, we now move on to Father Michael Lapsley, um, a former member of the TRC, uh, member of society, a renowned activist, um, who needs very little introduction as well, having taken a stand at a time when it was not fashionable in our country, uh, even to the point of being subject to severe violence by the state, he maintained his stance nonetheless, remained committed in the liberation struggle and has gone on after 1994 to speak on behalf of the vulnerable, not only our own, but also those who have come across our shores, speaking on their behalf because they too matter, that they too are human beings. Uh, he has suffered violence, um, pain, and the question is, can you overcome? Do you recon how do you reconcile? Father, you've been involved in a number of these projects. The South Africans complain about foreign nationals who are taking their jobs, this and that. There seems to be an ordering of humanity that if you are local, therefore you matter more than foreigners. How do we, in light of our scarce resources, uh, how do we maintain our humanity? Uh, given the desperation that we are in, uh, do we necessarily have to be given first preference over others? How do you navigate through these things? Father Lapsley. Uh, Professor, <clears throat> thank you very much and uh, greetings to the, uh, to the audience. Um, it's, it's a great honor to have the opportunity and thank you to the National Heritage Council for uh, inviting me. I should just say by slight correction, I was not uh, a member of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, but in fact, I, I started a parallel process to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that we called an Institute for Healing of Memories, uh, recognizing that all South Africans had been damaged by our past, 
all of us had stories to tell and all of us needed space to speak um, and to deal with our psychological, emotional and spiritual wounds. But let me just say how honored I am to be on um, a platform with uh, the Honorable Speaker, Tandi Madisa, Sis Tandi, Comrade Tandi. Um, I see her as a kind of uh, living ancestor um, and, and who continues to inspire us and I'm sure that Charlotte Makeke in heaven looks down in, at Tandi and says, ah, so they are continuing in my tradition. Um, I want to just uh, refer, as Sis Tandi did, to that wonderful quote of Nelson Mandela when he says, I realized that, that if I did not leave hatred and bitterness at the prison door, I would still be a prisoner. And that I also recognize for myself, having received a, a letter bomb from the apartheid state, that if I was filled with hatred, bitterness, self-pity, desire for revenge, that I would be a victim forever. But also, I was accompanied by people all over the world on my journey of healing. So my, my suffering was acknowledged, reverence, recognized, and that helped me to move from victim to survivor to victor. But it also led me to realize that we needed to create these spaces where all of us would be able to deal with, uh, with what we have inside of us. There's a wonderful quote from Chief Lutuli who says, those who think of themselves as victims eventually become the victimizers of others. And I want to relate that um, to many historical examples, but also even to uh, trying to make sense of gender-based violence. I want to focus in uh, on two areas that Comrade Tandi referred to towards the end of her speech. Uh, and that was the issue of racial reconciliation and the issue of gender. Part of the work of the Institute has been to create platforms for military veterans on all sides of the struggle. So we've been together with members, people who have been part of the South African Defense Force and uh, the different liberation armies, whether APLA, the ANC, whoever, coming together to tell each other their stories. Now, these are people who were trained to kill each other, who did kill each other. And now the years are passing and they still carry inside them a lot of play, a lot of pain, a lot of disappointment, um, and often frustration and anger against our new democratic order. But the, our experience is the more people heal, the more they become freed to be committed to work for human rights, not to continue uh, oppressing one another. And just uh, yesterday, I was in uh, Tembisa and uh, meeting young people from Tembisa who are part of our Restoring Humanity project together with some of the children of the Mamelodi massacre. And I think at times I am tempted to despair about the direction we're going as a country, but what fills me with hope is young people the new generation of human rights defenders. So this group of some of the children of the Mamelodi massacre have decided to do um, a drama later in the year, a major theater piece to commemorate the Mamelodi massacre. So in a way, they are bringing before us the unfinished business. And I think perhaps the, the one thing that we haven't highlighted enough is that our democratic state failed to deal with what it was recommended to do by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, it recommended there be at least 100 cases that needed to be prosecuted. And we never did that. And that is, a, I think, a deep wound. And I think uh, today of uh, some other 
ghosts, if you like, that will be continuing to haunt us for a long time to come. Um, people like Matthew Goniwe, Fort Alata, Neil Agate, Imam Haron. Uh, it is a shame on our society that these people of whom it was said they committed suicide, they slipped on the soap, um, are only now beginning to have their dignity restored. So I think it's of great importance if we are going to move forward uh, as a society that we revisit the uh, recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, even as we have to open up the, the numbers of victims in the kind of way that, um, that my sister Marge Jobson has talked about. But let me really come towards an end and talk about this issue of, as a nation, on the one hand, we have to do the things, as Sistandi has said, that would help us as South Africans of all races to find each other. But to do that, we have to face that we are still a traumatized society. But also we have to grab hold of this, in a way, age-old issue in our work of healing of memories across the world. The stories that we hear most frequently is of gender-based violence all over the world. Uh, so, but for us, we have some of the most egregious uh, violation of the rights of women. So we need a national conversation. Now, as, as an institute, we're trying to, in our own modest way, um, work on this. And one of the ways we're doing that is with a program called From Boys to Men, because we won't end gender-based violence unless we deal with how the boy child is brought up unless we as men are able to find healthy ways of dealing with our anger. And I think often part of the reality is that uh, men, especially black men, were humiliated under apartheid um, for centuries. And sometimes, again, I think the victims become the victimizers. You have this, this bitterness inside you, and it, it plays itself out in the bedroom. So unless we as men can have the spaces to deal with our vulnerability and our pain, we won't be able to deal with this issue of gender-based violence. Of course, patriarchy is everywhere, um, but we have a particularly virulent form of it. And Sistandi also pointed out, uh, we see it so in the church uh, as well. And uh, I would agree that, um, that, that perhaps uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, was the great role model of women and was the bulwark of the church, where often it's the men um, who are lifted up. But maybe just on that religious note, on Good Friday, I am uh, preaching in the Gruta Kirk, the Gruta Kirk in Cape Town. And one of the questions I'm asking, you know, on Good Friday, there was a period where uh, white mothers prayed and listened to forces' favorites. And at the same time, black mothers sang in Korsi Sikilele, uh, maybe sang, sang Hambagatlium Konto and listened to Radio Freedom. I think it must have been very confusing to God to listen to these, to these opposing prayers. And all I can feel is that God wept. God wept. Um, so it is a dangerous moment, but we need to face our past and move forward in the future to, as a wounded people, not to continue the wounding, but to become the healers of one another. But we can only do that if we as South Africans face our woundedness, have a national conversation in which we are able to speak not just of the politics, but also psychology, emotionally, spiritually. And so then we can work for justice and deal with our unfinished business as a country. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much, Father. Uh, that was quite um, insightful. And I'm, I'm, I'm very keen. I doubt that, well, I don't know him as much as you do, but I doubt that God was confused and told he's all-knowing. Uh, so uh, maybe <laughs> he understood your, your singing perfectly well. Um, I, 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 I am quite keen to, to find out how you, you enable these, uh, these men to, 
reimagine their manhood without this aggressive masculinity as part of their identity. How do you get them there? Um, perhaps you can share some stories with us at some point. Um, I'm sure our, our audience uh, have a lot to ask. They've had a lot to think about from a variety of interesting perspectives, insights, uh, knowledge, and even cancer, um, which all of which I'm sure have provoked uh, certain questions in our minds. Um, I would, if there are any questions, I would encourage uh, part of the audience or our audience to start raising those questions. Uh, I'm, I'm being helped, or I should be helped by NHC uh, staff from behind the scenes to identify the hands. Uh, I might not see all of them from my end. Um, Zama, are you seeing any hands uh, on your side? I'm told that we also have journalists. Um, so journalists can also fire away their questions. Uh, yes, Sama? Uh, there's a hand from Emmanuel Paladi. Uh, yes, Emmanuel. Uh, please take it away. Okay, um, uh, thank you, Chairperson. Yes, and be brief. You're not making and, your, your own speech, so be brief in your question, please. <laughs> okay, um, let me thank you all, um, and uh, Mr. Andy Mudise, the Speaker of Parliament, and all uh, the speakers that came forth, um, uh, and also the National uh, Heritage Council for inviting us. My name is Emmanuel Paladi. Um, at the acting CEO of a Slopetema Foundation. My question uh, relates to um, the legacy of um, uh, the unsung heroes like uh, Slopetema and others of the, the 1940s and the 1912 era, like during the uh, the founding of uh, the ANC uh, during that era of the World War II. Um, my question relates more to do with the culture uh, preservation and also and also um, the principles. Um, uh, given uh, Mr. Ndimudise has spoken of gender-based violence, um, how will we <coughs> how will we um, teach the the youth of today, the values of um, Richard Victor Slopetema, Sol Plaki, and also going through the various timelines of uh, Nelson Mandela and everybody um, to the present day. Um, how will we preserve the teachings or the knowledge um, and the values learned from those different eras to, uh, to make sure that we do grow a society that um, mirrors the people like Slopetema so that um, when we look at the issue of gender-based violence today, it is very, it is very troubling because day in and day out we hear stories, it's like there's no end to it. So um, right. how will we... Uh, how do we approach that? Uh, let me leave it yeah. right how, there. How do we package that history about these iconic figures and communicate, communicate it to the younger generation in a way that inspires them to emulate yes. these heroes? Um, yes. uh, is there another hand? Uh, whilst people are still thinking about questions, uh, Sistandi, can we go back to you perhaps to answer some of the questions that have been raised? Um, th thank you, thank you, uh, program director. Um, 
just the last one. How mm. do we package? How do we ensure that future generations understand? It? I think um, the simple question is that we look to the writing down of our history, preserving that history, but also making sure that that history is not just put somewhere. It goes right down. Our children are taught, are taught not to hate, are taught um, not to segregate, you know, small things like that. But it is important also to, to say that um, it is not just the generation of the Solplachis that has been forgotten. One of the greatest art activists I know, uh, the one you, you dance to, that song, the mother to the boy, a political prisoner, um, a member of MK, the organizer of that big Mamelodi uh, match. She died. The funeral was dismal. Nobody remembered. And I'm singling out Gunama Kweri because Gunama Kweri also talks to how South Africa is burying its history, especially around women. We've been written out of history. You speak about ex-political prisoners. You don't you speak about Roman Island these days. If there is any benefit, you say it is for the Roman Islanders. The women were fewer, were treated worse than the men. We hardly saw sunlight. We had to go on hunger strike just to change a dress once a month. So you, you, you begin to then look at how do we really do what Emmanuel says we must do? Preserve the history so that we may never repeat it. And I want to link this to the TRC process. Um, I st a bit, maybe two, three years ago, I went to Chile and uh, I went to the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Museum. And uh, for the first time since I came out of jail, I broke down. I broke down because us having refused to go to the TRC because we felt that our pain was too deep. We felt that we couldn't go back and face the humiliation and whatever was done to us in public. When we were in Chile, I realized that, in fact, part of our problems today is that we rushed the truth and reconciliation process. Chile has just concluded. They started long before us. They are just in the, now in the process of arrests and prosecutions. They, they have sectioned off the atrocities. And it was going into the women's and children's section that brought me because in South Africa we we, we mum we don't we don't get the uh, we don't want to open up the, the the wounds but in fact because we are not opening up the wounds we're not addressing what eats us up and and that is why we blackmail each other so for me it would be something and I have encouraged the president when I came back I said to him. Once things settle down, please go. Because I can tell you, I don't cry easily. I don't break. I did. Now, I want to link this to what a, a Professor Andrew said. Yes, the traditional methods and the indigenous knowledge becomes very, very important. When uh, the genocide in Rwanda happened. Um, I, I, I went in there, I think I went in there two, three, four times to work with women to face what was happening. Firstly, there was the refusal, national refusal to bury the dead. And we had to work through with women that it was for the di dignity of the departed to do that. Because in their grief, they wanted the world to see the brutality of what had gone down in their country. Um, oh, sorry. Um, this comes from having grandchildren giving you tea. <laughs> um, I must apologize. <laughs> when, when the 
the was the standoff between the Hutus and the Tutsis. It was the women's, because I concentrated on working with women, it was the women's tent that then said, but there are three nationalities in Rwanda. And we insisted on bringing the Batwa people to the table. And the Batwa were quiet. And they said to me, no, let them fight and kill each other. Our time will come. And that is when I realized that it was dangerous. And I said, no, you will talk in this session. Because it was important to make sure that in the reconciling, Rwanda had to begin to play fair with everybody. Because the Batwa were saying, over the generations, these two have been competing. We are left out of everything. So when you can reconcile, you must also go back to those things. It was the women who came out with the solution of going back to and using the kachacha. And we took that resolution of the women's tent into the men's tent and we said, because you have standing room, they were, they, there was no place in the prisons. And people died standing because of how tough it was. This is a solution. So yes, I am I'm in absolute agreement. Indigenous solutions are sometimes better solutions rather than the important solutions from people who sometimes do not understand the dynamics of the people there. Um, I would say that we, 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 in the current thing, I would challenge the indigenous um, uh, traditional healers to actually stand up and be counted. They should be giving us the solution. They should be saying, Mkhonyana, this, this is how you do this, and they should be. So that it is not, um, I complain because you are not seeing what I can do, but I'm not telling you what I can do. Now, when you build, everybody brings the, their two pens to the table and say, if we mix all together, this is the solution we can come with. And I'm also saying that post the negotiations and when we got into the new South Africa, we lost a lot of stuff in South Africa. One of those was the IPs of South Africa. And they were all stolen, all, whatever it is. And that is why today your ability to produce this, e, 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 what, uh, what do you call it? Vaccines quickly in South Africa was hampered because when you now said the, the border, the country is open, we are all equal, some stuff went away to Europe, to where, where, and you impoverished yourself as a people because you did not think that if you bring black and white together, you can actually be strong. So I would say, yes, there are a number of things that uh, need to be looked at. I don't even want to go through to the Ingonyama Trust because I have a very different view on or from the professor. But I think that where land is, where cultural com communities are, that in fact nothing takes back. And traditionally, traditionally women were not oppressed in those settings. Women were not oppressed. Women actually inputted into the final decisions there. It was a system which listened to women and listened to men and then brought the solution that is taken from both to the table. So it is important that we always do what we need to do. As far as the youth are concerned, yes, the youth must be able to criticize us, but not in a chaotic way, not in a way that actually strips us of our dignity. I teach my children that you can say whatever you want to say. You can fight with anybody, as long as you leave that person's dignity intact. And dignity for us who are previously disadvantaged who were tortured and dehumanized is very important in South Africa. 
You take my dignity. You really touch me where I don't want to be touched. And some of us reconcile not because we feel too weak, but we reconcile because where we were taken is where we don't want to see our grandchildren being taken. And so when we reach out, it is because we know how bad it was. We know what we went through, what our parents went through. We don't want to see it repeating itself. And we know that unless we bring people together, unless we find common solutions, we don't have a future. I think I'll stop there, Prof. Sister Andy, uh, thank you. Um, are there any questions from the parliamentary group? Uh, any questions from that end? Doesn't look like it. Uh, Zama, did you want to say something? Yes, we have a hand from Mr. Kwezi from Luan. Oh, okay, yes. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much uh, to all the esteemed uh, presenters and honorable speaker. Uh, my question <coughs> is as follows. With, when we work in heritage, we are supposed to gather this memory and present it. There is often concern with the holders of the memory that uh, you are either commercial we've lost you there quasi concerned with the holders of the memory uh, zama what happened to quasi if he can't come back, then he can write his question down somewhere. Do we have another? I'm back. No, let's move on. Um, is, is there is there another hand or question, uh, Zama, before we allow uh, other panelists to to make their closing remarks? and respond to one or two questions? There are no more hands, Prof. Okay, um, can, I, can, I, can I ask uh, Colette, is there, is there any closing remark that you wanna make? Then uh, Marjorie, uh, then uh, Father, and lastly, um, Ndrovo. Uh, Colette, closing uh, remarks briefly, please. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor. And I also would like to thank uh, the speakers and uh, precisely what um, our um, uh, Parliament uh, Speaker, uh, Honorable Tandi Mudise, has emphasized. I think uh, it's, it's about time that um, we do more uh, in terms of forging relations uh, with various stakeholders there, you know, to accelerate what the gains of this country has uh, has done in terms of building uh, progressive constitutions and incorporating all what apartheid work against. We have all those values written down and uh, uh, we, we should not take it for granted that the future generation uh, will automatically know what has happened and to chart a way forward uh, in building a culture based on human rights, non-discrimination and equality, and where women live uh, without fear uh, in safe environments, uh, re respecting them as women and, uh, and uh, you know, recognizing their roles as well uh, in public, uh, in private sphere, and, uh, you know, uh, in family as well, uh, to, to be respected, you know. Uh, I think there's been a lot of delay in achieving that. And uh, we should continue using um, our heroes and heroines, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to demonstrate the, 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 the sacrifices that they managed to achieve under hostile environments, that a mm -hmm. democratic environment cannot begin to copy, you know, previous acts of apartheid, which were 
design and uh, you know described as a policy described as a crime against humanity. We should not be seen to be entertaining that. I All think right. we have done a lot in becoming strong. Let us have that boldness to translate that onto the ground. And my last point is, in this kind of events, let us have simultaneous translation. Right now we engage, I know we are on face, uh, social media. How is a person, a, a person with disability, like a person who's mute, is able? There was no sign language, there was no Zulu, there was no Sotho. I can imagine there are many people who want to speak, who want to engage, to engage on this. Simultaneous translation needs to be taken seriously so that people can express themselves in languages, uh, in local languages. Uh, I thank you again for granting me this opportunity. Well put, well put. Uh, Marjorie? Um, yes, um, yeah, thank you, Professor Medley. Um, there were two issues that came, I was asked. Um, perhaps the last one was, do families of victims ever get back to normal life? That was one. We have found that you need a specific process to move people through dealing with loss, dealing with what, what gets fragmented in people, that isolates them from other people, that breaks their trust with other human beings, to actually, the next stage would be mourning their losses. We didn't mourn in this country. People are only now recognizing the value of mourning and grieving. Um, there's a lot of complex grief in this country, grief about loss of land and jobs and in, on and on. It's a huge, huge amount of work to be done. And only then uh, being able to start being economically independent, but through facilitated interventions with people, the trauma is incredibly deep and it doesn't happen just um, leaving people to their own devices. So we find, you know, building small collectives of people, creating the enterprise opportunities for them, trying very much to get partnerships with the private sector, it's beginning to, to play a role. It's very, very important. The other issue that you raised was um, about um, dialogues, uh, victim offender dialogues. We've been involved in a quite a large number of dialogues because our Department of Justice would not give people um, parole unless the victims agreed that they were at a place where they had reckoned with how they had harmed people. So that has meant quite a lot of work from our side. Um, they are mostly they they do help very very much. Um, there's of course a lot of suspicion in the beginning, but it is a process. So we've done quite a lot of that. Um, in terms of dealing with torturers, it's a far far more complex because people who have become torturers have, in our understanding, been sort of psychologically, psychosocially, permanently disabled. They they are. They've committed such atrocities that they actually find it very hard to come back from there. I mean, so um, that's a huge problem. But the area in which we've probably made the most progress um, is in responding to a request from the leadership of the Dutch Reformed Church that said we believe that we need to enter a, a journey of decolonization and we think we would like to work with Kulumani to embark on that journey. And um, I was hearing this week how much that engagement meant to the moderator of the whole Dutch Reformed Church. Um, because I mean, the, the fundamental thing about it was that when we met with you, there were 10 of them and 10, and, and 10 survivors who've been through numbers of processes. And what they said is, we didn't get blamed. We, we became equal human beings. I listened to your suffering and you heard my dilemmas and you recognized me. And we didn't end up pointing fingers at each other. We just found each other. And I think that's the work that has to be taken forward in, in, in very, very important ways. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think I've answered the various questions that came up. But thank you for right. this opportunity. Thanks, thanks Dr. Jobson. Uh, Father? 
Yes, no, th <clears throat> thank you very much, and thank you to everyone who's uh, contributed today. Um, I think we, we, in order to look at where we are and where we need to go, I think we will continue to be haunted by the spirits of Ntokozisi Ntumba, Collins Koza, the families of uh, the Marikana who, uh, victims who died. Um, so the issue of human rights and policing needs to be faced. I see today they've just released the report of the on the police um, that had sat for two years on the Minister of Police desk. Um, we have to reach a point that we can demonstrate as the people of South Africa without being uh, shot or in danger of being shot. And I think we're also haunted by those mothers and grandmothers who were, who were hosed down uh, during the time of lockdown when they came out looking for their uh, subsistence. So I think we always need to look at the bottom to find out how far we've got um, in defending human rights uh, in practice. Uh, but as Marjorie said, when we hear each other's story, the commonality of our pain unites us. And then we can work together to create uh, a just society. Thank you. Thanks, Father. Uh, Professor Jobu, you had a couple of questions. Briefly, please. Thank you, Professor Jan. Um, I just want to talk about two issues. Uh, firstly, the Ingonyama Trust, and then secondly, the, some aspects of indigenous knowledge and what uh, Univen is doing in that particular regard. Um, I, I would want to go back to the Ingonyama Trust and say, although there may be problems, you know, coming out of that, and I've identified two, there may be others, you know, where you are saying there have been issues in some communities where there have been fights about the authorization of uh, mining rights in certain communal lands. And, you know, members of the community have co complained that uh, mining rights have been awarded or granted without their permission. There, is, there have been cases also of uh, abuse of uh, some of these uh, communal rights, uh, contrary to Section 2.28 of the, 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 the Act itself, where some of these rights have been subjected to leases. I'm saying this are obviously social vices, like in a normal society, there will be some deviance. But I'm saying the, 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 the Ingonyama Trust itself is actually an institution that the Constitution recognizes in, in Section 30 you know, and 31. And I'm saying the, the whole aim was to give you know, people living in these rural uh, areas some security of tenure of sorts and i would want to say i've actually uh, holders of land you know communal land do have a documentation that proves title and uh, something that we call it title it's not your normal title deed and I'm, I'm again since i'm talking indigenous knowledge here i'm actually saying to most people we prefer you know when we talk of security of tenure we talk about title deed and so on so that document that is given to anyone who owns communal land. It is also a title. Of course, if one goes to the courts, <clears throat> there may be a problem with recognition, but I'm saying uh, if we could fight and say actually that title is uh, recognized. I am not saying the Ingoyama Trust is something that we should present in very glorious terms as something that doesn't have problems, but I'm saying it's not something that uh, we should completely throw away in the absence of uh, empirical evidence that, uh, you know, the people that are subject to it are actually unhappy. I know there was a, an inquiry or a commission headed by the former let's president. Go, let's Trump. not go too deep into that. Yes. Job. I think you have pretty and, much uh, defended yeah, yeah, that, it. Let's I've made my point then on. around the Ingonyama Trust. I just want to go quickly, indigenous knowledge, uh, of course, we are anticipating that it's going to adapt, you know, with as culture is dynamic as we move along. But coming to the University of Venda, what we are currently doing is that uh, we actually have an indigenous uh, knowledge unit housed in the Faculty of uh, Humanities and Social Sciences. And then we have a research chair in indigenous knowledge. And then in terms of the involvement of traditional uh, healers, uh, traditional medicine, actually the Department of Public Health does have a standing partnership or a project 
that specifically focuses on how traditional medicine can be modernized and actually, you know, be subjected to the pharmaceutical and, you know, the, the, the medicines approval process. That is work in progress. Uh, a lot of work needs to be done, but certainly something is going on in that specific regard. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this discussion. We've all made very useful inputs, and I think they provide food for further thought, for further reflection. And I will now hand over, I think, to the chairperson of the NEC Council to make closing remarks. Um, Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, uh, Chair and, and moderator. And, and thank you for the sterling work that you've really done in, in, in leading us through this. Um, and you've, you've done it really excellently and your comments and your assessments and you know, your, your, your comments after each speaker were really excellent and really highlighted the issues that came out today. And thank you so much, uh, Honorable uh, Tandi, um, Tandi Mudise for for really spending this whole time with us. Um, we know that you have a very, very busy schedule and with everything that is happening in your portfolio, but we really appreciate that you could use this time to share with, with South Africa, uh, you know, your thoughts on, on these pertinent issues. And thank you so much. Um, and to all fellow council members, especially our panelists, um, and thank you so much for your thoughtfulness and taking the time to prepare these and to think through them. And we appreciate you as the National Heritage Council. And thank you for all the leaders in, in heritage and all colleagues and sister organizations, members of the media that are present here. And all ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for participating today. This was really excellent. Um, I wish things were really normal and, and we could just have it in, in, a, in a specific venue with every proper setup. Um, but it's just unfortunate that we could have it in these uh, circumstances. I believe that it will go a long way in, in reaching, um, you know, our public and, and fellow South Africans. So on behalf of the National Heritage Council, I, I really send here to thank you so much. And just to say a few comments um, in, in my closing remarks, and we, we really appreciate you for the incredible wisdom that was shared today and the paradoxes that were reflected on in your in your speeches. Um, in the social sciences, um, there's a phrase called genesis or genesis and amnesia, um, you know, by Pierre Bourdieu, which, which really means a forgetfulness of the past or a process through which we forget our history, our histories. And, and I believe we don't want to be guilty of that. And I believe this is a proper platform to help us remember what we have learned in the past, what we have come through, you know, uh, as a nation, and 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 what we need to take forward um, in in uh, for future generations. Your interventions sharpened for us and um, a reflection on what inheritance, what kind of inheritance we are receiving and transmitting to future generations. This kind of reflection and remembrance empowers not only those who remember in navigating a better present, but also future generation in selecting a better inheritance. There is no doubt from your presentations that a legacy of human rights, liberation, struggle, and reconciliation is a treasurable foundation to build a society with dignity, equity, and redress for all. You have made it clear that human rights are not only about court processes, but cut to the heart of a better life for all and is a product of human solidarity, you have left us with uh, no illusion as to the complexity that accompanies, accompanies reconciliation uh, or the high price and the noble goals of the liberation struggle. In doing so, you have placed a heavy responsibility on all of us at the NHC um, and in the various sectors as well to do more, to leave are the values of the liberation struggle. From all your comments, it is clear that this heritage of human rights, liberation and reconciliation is an important glue for our emerging society. It cannot be sacrificed, obviously, on the altar of lack of funding, 
but it has to be handled judicially and sustainably. We thank our guest uh, lecturer, Honorable Tandim Dise. We thank all the panelists and the moderators again. We thank the audience, the media, and the technical team, everybody who made this day a success. The words uh, that have been spoken here will affect some of our programming going forward at the NHC. Um, you know, with a new council now in, um, but most importantly, we hope that tri uh, they trigger a new kinds of partnerships and collaborations where these values will be re-examined, represented in relation to the sites um, uh, what that they claim primarily. We know that today's conversation has helped promote a better understanding of the heritage of human rights, liberation and reconciliation. We hope that you will be a partner with us in, uh, in exploring other themes of the vastly rich heritage um, of African roads to liberation. I'm, 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 I'm saying this word, certain that we are come to an end of this uh, wonderful, you know, engagement, and but uh, want to really, you know, propose a closure to this meeting, uh, Chair. I ask that this conversation continue in other platforms and manifest in all kinds of heritage, you know, technologies. I also ask that you know some of these conversations be leveraged in support of the World Heritage Nomination Evaluation and Advocacy Work. You know, wishing everyone um, uh, an excellent and a happy Easter. And thank you so much for your engagements. We appreciate you so much. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. 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 Mm -hmm.